of the erstwhile royal family of Kanke. Today is a very special resilience lecture. It's our 25th resilience lecture. So it's a kind of jubilee today. And um, it's also very special, as you know, each and every resilience lecture is unique in itself. Today is, um, is a twice kind of celebratory event. First, um, Dr. Aditya will also talk about his new book, which will be released in October, Kings, Spirits and Memory in Central India. And you can already tell from the title, it is very unusual because the study of princely India, the study of royal families in India is very much underrepresented. But at the same time, he's telling some unique stories. And um, I have here a drawing of a peacock without wings by Janga from the Gond community in central India. And somehow this drawing, very simple drawing with a black pen is to me symbolic of the story that we are going to hear. And although this is a story about Kankhya Palace, its history, the family, the location, and the interaction between um, and the environment and the other people associated with the palace, not specifically about the book, although towards the end of the lecture, um, Dr. Deo will talk about um, the new book as well and will introduce it. Um, he wrote once, and I'm quoting him um, in this very elegant prose, tribal peoples as history's formative other. So somehow this is the story of the ruler and the ruled. It's also of the modern and the anti-modern. And somehow there is a similarity between the tribal history, which is the context of Kankhya Palace in central India, but also um, the former Maharajas, because this is also, they're also part of something that is anti-modern. So somehow, as a historian, it's really uniquely interesting that if we have the time, maybe we can have a quick conversation afterwards. You are telling the story both as a distant observer, as a historian, but at the same time being part of this. So this is very challenging. You are tackling a number of highly charged, very complex terms, religion, culture, civilization, how they are merging, how they are changing, how, how they are sometimes different and not so different. All of this is a fascinating story that really deserves to be heard. And with this, I'd like to um, um, give it over to you. And thank you very much for being here, for taking the time. And I can't wait um, to hear the lecture and share it uh, with our audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Esther Schmidt. Good evening, everyone. I'll just take a moment to pull out a PowerPoint presentation that I will be sharing with you. So please bear with me. Is it visible to everyone? Yes. Yes. So good evening, everyone, again. And uh, I'm really grateful to Dr. Esther Schmidt. Now, I think uh, over the last two months or so, a friend of mine, Mimi, uh, and uh, the Center for Historical Historic Houses, at the OP Jindal Global University, the School of Art and Architecture, for giving me this opportunity to uh, share uh, our journey of Kanke Palace uh, with you. And also, of course, uh, to give me a platform to tell you about uh, my forthcoming book, which is very closely related to that project, and uh, which has to do with a certain uh, human dilemma about the self and about how to put yourself out there. Uh, that I'm sure all of you will understand at some level or the other. Uh, before I begin, I would also like to extend my gratitude to all who have helped me put this together, along with, of course, Dr. Schmidt. And uh, there is, of course, Sukadya from the center who uh, was the first to contact me actually about this in relation to another event of the center. Uh, my student at St. Stephen's College, Kudrat Singh, who's also uh, fortunately part of the center and is learning a lot uh, as a result of that. Uh, Julian, uh, who I met a few days back, Dr. Schmidt's interns at the center, Hope and Jenny, 
and my former student and friend Avinash Kashyap, who has helped me put this together. Now, let me start with uh, a sense of where Tanke Palace heritage is located. And from there, I will then move on to the story of our journey as a historic house and a heritage property that is open to tourism and hospitality. And after that, I will eventually speak a little about my book. I've had an extremely long day. It so turned out that very suddenly, I was informed a few days back that uh, the admissions at my, my college, St. Stephen's, in the University of Delhi for students for this year would begin today. So I've been in an admissions meeting from morning 8.30 till about evening 6.30. So in case you find me uh, slipping into a stream of sort of consciousness kind of a zone or uh, having a momentary lapse of reason to use a few cliches that will resonate with uh, all of you. Uh, then please pardon me, right? Now, the region of Kankir is located in the southern part of the Indian state of Chhattisgarh, which is one of its youngest states, and was founded in 2000, not very far from when we are at the moment. You can see its location in what I would call the heart of India, a uh, little to the south of it, the southern sort of heart of it, but uh, still I would like to believe a heart of it because historically it's been part of central India. And uh, although it might look small to you from here, and India is a large country, the size of Kankir is about a one and a half times the total territory of Goa. So that would give you a sense of uh, what kind of a place, how large a place we are talking about. Kanke lies interestingly between two very important geographical formations in the Indian subcontinent, the central Indian hills of the Vindhyas and the Satpuras, as you can see, and of course, the Deccan Plateau in the south. In my larger work on Chhattisgarh, I'm going to be arguing about, and that's like forthcoming, forthcoming. It's still in progress and it'll probably uh, get completed many, many uh, months down the line. I'm trying to argue that Chhattisgarh is sort of pulled both ways, uh, northwards towards North India. And it's also sometimes clubbed together with the Hindi speaking states of India. But I would rather, uh, for various reasons, as you would understand, like to, like to think of myself as a Deccani, a Deccani, somebody who belongs to the Deccan and uh, in, in peninsular India. So Kanki lies somewhere between these hills in central India and the Deccan Plateau. On both sides, in the north and the south, therefore you can see extensive hilly lands and uplands and forested area. And it is only in the middle, as you can see over here, if my cursor is visible to you, that the Mahanadi River, which interestingly originates in what used to be the territory of the former princely state of Kankir, drains the central area of Chhattisgarh, creating a kind of a central river basin. But to the north and the south, you have these hill and forest areas. This shatter zone topography and geography of Kankir, this borderland area of Kankir, gives it a fascinating geography. And you can see from the picture here in front of you that there are these hills and hillocks and uh, forests uh, now somewhat degraded because of, of course, extensive deforestation over the period of time, which rise suddenly from the landscape and uh, dot it with these interesting landforms and rock formations. Uh, each side of Kanke, just drive out and you will find some very, very interesting rock formations, a little like what my, you might see very close to Hyderabad. And Hyderabad, I think, is very much part of this geographical region. So, you know, there are forests and there are hills and there are these rock formations and they make the geography of Kanke rather pretty. 
you can see one such rock formation. Some of these can get actually quite spectacular. Right behind, you can see rising in the background, these gentle hills. These are not really mountains. They are still hills, but they are substantial enough and large enough uh, for them to create an interesting uh, framing kind of geographical uh, you know, mood. And these rock formations in the middle are very different kinds and, and types and very dramatic sort of forms really make the whole thing so much more uh, interesting. See, there's one more over here. Uh, this is in fact uh, the location of a prehistoric rock shelter where there are actually now prehistoric rock paintings. Some of these rock shelters in Kankir have uh, prehistoric rock art, which is some of the oldest in central India. It is not yet properly documented because it is still being discovered. Kankir has been, as I will argue, a marginal kind of land historically. And so uh, the focus has not quite been on it for most of the historical period. Uh, so I sometimes joke that finding rock shelters, prehistoric rock shelters, and then within them prehistoric rock art is one of the pastimes of young adventurous people in Kankir. There are any number of people who just go out on a whim on a Sunday or a holiday looking for these rock shelters. And many of them have actually found them. And very, very interesting and valuable these rock shelters are. This is the nature of the forest land at the moment. As you can see, it is not extremely dense, but there is something of that sense of what might have been. Extensive, as I said, deforestation has gradually led to uh, this state of affairs. But even today, uh, if you walk into these forest lands, you will be able to get an experience of a forest. Interestingly, these forests are the rim of what you might know uh, more popularly as the jungle country of uh, you know, Kipling. And uh, of course, Kipling was writing about uh, the very center, center of India, but this is the outlying area. So this is very much in some senses part of that continuum. This is the kind of landscape where the jungle lore uh, of uh, Kipling's works was based. Now, because of the Mahanadi Basin, uh, you also have interspersed with these hills and hillocks and these forested areas, uh, somewhat uh, substantial sort of cultivated landscape as well. And this is what you can see here in this photograph, where you can see you know, agriculture, which is grain cultivation, mainly rice, and then dotting the landscape there are these hills. And uh, this is what sort of creates an interesting uh, geoconflict in this area of the present day, where because of the expansion of agriculture and the gradual denudation and degradation of the forest and hill areas, uh, the Flora and fauna of the region are in danger. And very often the animals that uh, inhabit the still somewhat uh, extant forest lands and hills, uh, because of the pressure of various kinds of environmentally harmful uh, economic activities like mining for concrete, for building activities, etc., tend to wander into uh, areas that they are not quite expected to be in. And that often creates a kind of interesting tension between peoples and, and uh, uh, nature, which uh, all of you are, I'm sure, familiar with, and which is uh, very much uh, the stock story of Indi India's environmental sort of crisis. Uh, the palace, uh, the Kankir Palace, which is located right in the middle of the town, used to be at some point outside it when it was built. But now this is the extent of the expansion of settlement in Kankir that it is in the middle of the town. Now, some of these animals, especially the great Indian sloth bear, uh, which is very sort of common in the forests and hills of Kankir because of the extremely uh, stressful nature of their existence now where food and water are becoming scarce in their natural habitats, wander into the town of Kankir and they're looking for food, of course and then get chased by stray dogs. 
So the Kanke Palace is this interesting green area right in the heart of Kanke. So often these animals who have stayed far, very far in and are a little lost because of uh, the dangers that they encounter in this alien sort of uh, landscape tend to run in to hide into the rather uh, refuge-like, sanctuarious sort of, uh, you know, restful area of Kanke Palace, especially because the Kanke Palace heritage, as I will tell you, uh, is actually full of orchards. So every season you have some or the other uh, fruit bearing tree, uh, you know, giving its uh, bounties to, uh, you know, whoever will take it. And these animals then come in, find some rest and also food. And uh, we would love to keep thinking of this as a wonderful development, except that more recently we have found that this could actually pose some danger to some of the people who come into uh, the palace uh, compound for their work. This is one example of a prehistoric rock shelter. I haven't uh, given you a picture of the rock art because I feel that, uh, you know, taking photographs of that tends to expose it to uh, light, which damages them in the long run. I have some with me, probably later if some of you are interested, I could share it. But this is very typical of Kanke. Almost everywhere, about 15 kilometers out of the town, you will find an interesting, dramatic, spectacular, often rock shelter like this with huge boulders and very interesting cavernous kind of, uh, you know, places where prehistoric uh, human beings would have taken shelter and, of course, as you know, uh, lived their lives and drawn their arts and and the, and sort of you know told their life stories. So if you come to Kanke Palace Heritage, then you also get to be part of this story. Uh, our story is uh, incorporating all these stories here as well. The river Mahanati is also a very important geographical feature of Kanke. As I told you, it originates in the territory of the old princely state, although now because of the constant rearrangement of the territory in terms of districts and other such things with the, the modern administrative units into which uh, land area is divided now. Uh, that catchment area of the river Mahanadi has now become part of another district. But uh, historically and even naturally very much, the river Mahanadi basin, uh, which becomes one of the largest river basins of India, has its origins actually in the catchment area of a place called Sihava in Kanke. And it originates in an underground spring and then is joined by a large number of rills, rivulets, streams that come down all these hills and hillocks that I was talking about and that swell the river continuously until even as it leaves the Kanke district, uh, it becomes a fairly substantial river. So you can see this here, uh, that the river has become quite uh, large and the water uh, channel or the river bed has become quite extensive. But these are the kinds of rivers and, sorry, rills and rivulets, the smaller water bodies, uh, streams that come and constantly replenish the waters of the Mahanadi and make it that big, uh, fast flowing and hugely voluminous sort of river as it becomes by the time it goes into Orissa, where, as you know, it is dammed at Hirakud, which is such a, a spectacular water body uh, that, uh, you know, it is amazing that it has its origins in this very interesting small spring in Kanke. Uh, this is a, a set of temples in Sihava. The story goes that the kingdom of Kanke was, uh, well, not the kingdom of Kanke, actually, uh, my uh, family, the dynasty from which my family is, came into Kankir in the 14th century, more precisely 1385, uh, when the then ruler of the well-known city, uh, pilgrimage city of Puri, Veer Kanhadev, who had been suffering from leprosy, decided in a state of despondency to just give up his kingdom and wander off with a loyal group of followers into the jungles to the southwest of uh, the Orissa areas. And the story goes that wandering uh, further and further down, he then chanced upon this set of uh, 
interesting rivers and, and rivulets in the Sihava area and found the font of the river Mahanadi, which at that time was also the seat of some well-known in scriptural tradition, sages of the Indian or Indic tradition. And uh, there he was asked to bathe in the river. And lo and behold, once he did that, when he emerged from it, he was cured of his lep leprosy. And his figure was extremely resplendent. And there he stood effulgent, emitting a lot of light, uh, absolutely happy and, and ecstatic at this wonderful cure that he had found. Uh, the people were so impressed with him. And by that, I suppose, what is meant is the communities of this region, that they elected him to be their ruler. So very interesting origins of my family's uh, claim to rule. Uh, in sort of Kanki, which actually is from an election, a selection of the ruler by the peoples who are impressed by the wonderful body of this ruler that emerges unscathed and completely unblemished, cured of that affliction, leprosy. So something of, of Kanki and something of my family, even if uh, we think of it as coming from outside, although having now therefore lived here for about 600, 700 years, we are hardly outsiders. <clears throat> there is this interesting meeting of, of uh, roots, as it were. And so uh, the king then uh, established uh, his kingdom there, his first capital in Sihava, and built these temples there. These temples, I suspect, are not as old as the 14th or the 15th century, but are some kind of later uh, sort of additions to the original structure, which probably is still encapsulated uh, within the bower of this temple. It cannot be seen anymore uh, because it has been built over by these shikhas, but it is nevertheless there. So in some ways, it is that set of structures uh, that were built at that time. Now, of course, uh, having taken a different form, but still carrying in some senses, the essence of that experience. Now, uh, I think that uh, the kingdom of Kankir uh, remained a, a fairly sort of, uh, I wouldn't say democratic kingdom because that is a contradiction in terms, but a loose sort of kingdom of a king and local communities that had decided to share power. Of course, the king would always have wanted more power, but of course, the peoples also asserted their uh, own autonomy. And that led to the forging of an interesting political arrangement, which uh, lasted for a fairly long time. This is what my research through the oral traditions uh, is showing. Some of these stories go back actually to the 16th and the 17th centuries, at least. And they speak about the ways in which the king and the peoples of the area shared uh, power and sovereignty. So this is not to mitigate uh, the problems that monarchies pose in general as a, a kind of or a type of political system, uh, but nevertheless to shine light on the somewhat more complex and nuanced sort of histories that many of us have, which get simplified uh, by us into standard sort of tropes. So the kingdom of Kankir existed as this loose sort of arrangement of political relations between the king and fairly autonomous communities, I argue, uh, for a very long time uh, and was not incorporated into any large centralizing formation either of the north or of the south, uh, including that of the Bugabs, uh, who, as you know, uh, burnt their fingers when they tried to capture uh, Gondwana. And uh, that might have... Uh, uh, led them to strategically sort of uh, not attempt a proper sort of conquest of these areas of Central India of which Kankir was a part. So uh, Kankir and other kingdoms of this region might have escaped, though they were extremely small, might have escaped the centralizing uh, forces of the North and the South and therefore uh, escaped having um, become actually parts of these larger political entities until, of course, uh, the time of the Marathas. As you know, the Marathas are a very different and unique kind of political formation. 
uh, they were, were a kind of guerrilla force, uh, which ranged far and wide the Indian subcontinent, going as far as Kabul, actually. And of course, uh, uh, what uh, James Scott was, would call Zomia, you know, the northeastern parts of uh, the uh, Indian central uh, subcontinental lands, uh, as of course, all the way down to the south as well. And so uh, the area of central India lying so close to the heart of the Mar Maratha territory would scarcely have managed to escape their depredations. And so Kanke became subject to a large number of Maratha raids uh, and uh, might have had to then, uh, you know, cough up large amounts of revenue, uh, much to a much greater extent than it had ever done in the past. Even within the relationship of the king and the local communities, there would not have been such a level of expro expropriation of surplus as during the time of the Marathas. Uh, of course, the people resisted. The kings might have resisted because it dented their coffers. And the peoples definitely resisted. For example, in Kankir, I have come across stories uh, in the villages where people talk about how uh, the people in the villages would strew uh, the path of the marauding Maratha horsemen with pebbles because the horses would find it very difficult to uh, run or gallop easily over pebbles. So this is what we could call the weapons of the week. And uh, so there was that as well. But I don't think Kanker and other neighboring kingdoms would have been able to escape some or the other kind of a uh, extractive control of a, of a type they probably did not know before. Uh, this was subsequently followed by another major sort of centralizing impetus under the British colonial power who took over from the Marathas and then imposed what I would say a modern state structures, often encouraging and hurrying all these princes and kings of central India into taking uh, you know, recourse to modern governmentalities to organize their states as they now came to call them into efficient sort of extractive machines and uh, political systems of domination. So uh, it is only under the British really that many of these smaller kingdoms, which I think represented as many interesting traditions of rule and, and relationships between uh, peoples and their uh, rulers, eventually got reduced to uh, a standard format of a modern state uh, of the European kind. And everyone was asked to become uh, you know, part of that. In the documents of the Kankir princely state, I have come across the British officials actually giving a kind of tutorial to the rulers of Kankir and, uh, you know, worrying about how uh, they were not acting on their, um, their directives and going very slow into converting their rather ragtag, what I would say rudimentary uh, sort of kingdoms of political arrangements into proper, taut, compact, efficient, uh, government and administrative machines, you know, so, or apparatuses, whatever you might call them. And uh, so uh, eventually, of course, Kankir came under that kind of a sway and got integrated into what I would call is an all subcontinental or even a worldwide kind of narrative of colonialism, of course, and, and whatever follows in the wake of, of that. But I also believe that uh, because the British couldn't quite always control all parts of India with equal intensity, and because all these kingdoms came with their own histories and their own peculiar sort of uh, needs and requirements, and sometimes because in the case of Kankir, for example, they were not just important enough. Many of these kingdoms like Kankir got a considerable amount of freedom, even though they were within uh, the British Empire. And so many of these old arrangements between the rulers and uh, the peoples, where the peoples and their, gov their organizations and local institutions of government were very powerful and autonomous, continued to uh, be and to, to uh, be the kind of um, uh, the arrangement of, of political system in Kankir, even though, of course, Kankir was like other princely states in central India and elsewhere in the Indian subcontinent, surely and steadily coming under uh, the uh, sway of uh, modern uh, governance. Now, um, the Kanke Palace heritage 
a Kanke palace was actually not a palace at all to start with. When it was built in 1937, it served as a guest house to the colonial officials who would come into Kankir uh, to, of course, oversee the Bandobast or the administration from time to time. This interference became uh, fairly extended and uh, deep seated because of the minority of my grandfather, who, even though he technically ruled from 1925 to 1947, for most of that time, from 1925 to 1944, he was a minor. And so uh, British officials were constantly coming in to supervise government. And so this was actually a guest house for them, built in 1937, and was built apart from the old palaces that are located in the heart of the town. As I told you, it was actually built on the outskirts. Now, of course, the growing town has uh, completely taken Kanker Palace heritage over uh, and made it the center of its uh, sort of settlement. But at that time, it was essentially a guest house, an oversized bungalow. Uh, so it's not really as spectacular and as old as many of the palaces of Rajasthan uh, and Gujarat. It is much younger in lineage, in longevity. It, it is also uh, very modest in scale, although, as you can see, extremely elegant in composition. You can see a lot of the late colonial Eastern Indian, uh, British, uh, and of course, local traditions uh, sort of coming together in interesting sort of ways uh, here. So uh, this is how it started. But when my grandfather actually took up full ruling powers, and this is Maharaja Dheeraj Bhanu Pratap Dev, then he decided to shift into this mansion. I think probably because he felt it would be easier to manage than the rather unwieldy and old style palaces in the older part of the town. And so he started living here for, with, of course, uh, his wife, the former princess of the Sonpur state in Orissa, Rani Amulya, or Maharani Dhirani, actually, Amulya Prabhadevi, uh, who then took up place as his queen consort. Now, uh, even though that might be the case, uh, there was a shift in the, uh, the person who was living in uh, Tanker Palace heritage from colonial officials to the king. So it was then converted then, you know, notionally from a guest house into what you could call a palace. But uh, it had been conceived of as a large, a garden residence uh, from its first instance of you know conception and, and building. And it was called Radha Nivas Bagicha. Radha, as you know, is the female consort of the popular Indian deity Krishna. And the relationship of Radha and Krishna represents uh, an idiom of love and romance and leisure within the Indic tradition. So as Radha Nivas Bagicha, or literally the garden residence of Radha, the palace estate was supposed to be uh, a place of many attractions. As you can see, uh, the palace itself is located on the right center of the total compound, which is about 25 acres large. Uh, there is a pond and an island in the middle, which serves now as a resting place and must have then as well of rare migratory birds like the open-billed stork and the egret and the heron and other such uh, birds. Uh, and it had some quaint structures like an aquarium, which is octagonal in shape. Unfortunately, the uh, application I was working for did not have uh, an octagon. So I put in a hexagon. So please don't mind that, uh, but an aquarium. And it's an interesting kind of thing. And uh, we have tried to figure out how it might have been an aquarium, uh, whether it was an aquarium at all, but we've been told it was an aquarium. So received wisdom is of course, uh, you know, authentic wisdom. So we don't question that. We're trying to fit our own imaginations of how it might have been an aquarium into what we see there, even though it seems extremely puzzling that it would have been possible. It could have served as an aviary though, uh, but it was not referred to us at least as an aviary. So I have just added that in uh, to sort of 
legitimate my own theory about what th this might have been. A very interesting structure, which has now been converted into a restaurant, a gazebo restaurant. Then there was also this very interesting uh, enclosure for what I was told were man-eating tigers, and it was called Bhagwa Kholi, or the enclosure of the tiger. And Kankir was notorious for uh, its man-eating tigers. And many of the village lore is about them, an unusually large number in comparison to any other place I have known, although I must admit I don't know uh, and have really not uh, been privy to many other uh, possible cases. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, this is what it was meant for. Now we have converted it into an office of one of the two schools that we run in the, in the compound of the Kanke Palace heritage uh, property. And of course, the entire area is full of uh, greenery. It has a farm, it has orchards, uh, it has a botanical garden of rare uh, and uh, uh, very, very valuable medicinal plants and herbs. Uh, so you can see uh, the estate, uh, you can see the palace in the middle, surrounded by this grove of trees. And uh, then of course, you can see the town in some distance and the hills that ring Kankir uh, in uh, yet some more distance, right? So this is how uh, it is set. Uh, this is the veranda in the front of uh, the palace. And as you can see, uh, it has very interesting um, structural sort of aspects where, are, where there are these huge iron beams spanned or spanning uh, the entire length of uh, the walled area and the ceiling. And of course, then subspanned by uh, uh, wood, logs of wood uh, in the middle. This is the Darbar Hall, uh, which has a lot of trophies. This is one of the dilemmas uh, in the present day when we talk about uh, ecological sensitivity and so on and so forth. So how much of this is something we need to apologize for? and uh, how much of it can be accepted as part of the uh, of the time that it has come from you know contextualized in some senses this is the dining hall uh, this is an i've kind of pulled it out in order to fit the frame so the proportions are not quite right uh, this is a facade but let me see i think i seem to have missed something in between okay i'll come to that later uh, which is actually a plan of uh, the uh, structure itself. So if I was to just, uh, now that I have, uh, I seem to be missing it here, I'll just tell you how uh, it is uh, sort of planned. So it is a structure which has two parallel wings of rooms that are joined in the middle by a set of common rooms comprising the Darbar hall and the dining. The kitchen is located like it is typically located in Chhattisgarh residences from that time, from the late colonial period at some distance from the main structure and is connected to the dining room by a long passageway. This entire structure is fronted and uh, uh, by a veranda, which I showed you, and there's a similar veranda at the back as well. And there are several uh, annexes, uh, both behind the palace as well as some distance away from it. And in the front is this large raised circular garden, which we refer to as Gold Chakka. Uh, it is essentially a very elegant sort of building with very simple lines, except, as you can see, the trellised railings that seem to kind of break the monotony of the, uh, the plainness of the structure by giving an elegant sort of lilt to uh, the surface, the facade and, and the roof of, of the palace. And there are several different uh, recessed sort of railings here so that sometimes a set of railings can be seen all together one after the other, creating an interesting kind of cascading sense of uh, the height of the palace. This is one of the towers at the two sides. So these two flanks are topped in the front by these square towers with a canopied kind of structure at the top. And this is one of them framed by, of course, the Gulmohar tree uh, of, the, of which there are many. Uh, in the in the palace area. This is an interesting, dainty, quaint window 
uh, again, uh, the sill is rather large and is supported by these small pillars. And uh, the canopy is sort of somewhat ornate on the border so that when the light sort of shines through it, it creates an interesting sort of effect. Uh, this is a typical room within the palace. As you can see, uh, the ceiling is very high and there is ample light and occasion for aeration. The ventilators and the windows are the most wonderful part of the structure. Uh, this is the room in the front, which has a somewhat uh, sort of uh, haphazard uh, shape, uh, but that adds to the beauty of the room. This is the palace in the night. As you can see, the two towers and uh, the two wings. Okay. This is my father, and it is under him that uh, the palace was converted into a heritage property. Uh, my father was recognized as an ex ruler and died in 2001. Uh, it is under his supervision that the palace was uh, opened to guests as a heritage destination for hospitality and tourism. The person who was helming all this was my middle brother, Maharaj Kumar Surya Pratap Dev, also popularly known as Jolly, who unfortunately passed away very untimely uh, this April. So in some ways, I mean this to be a kind of tribute to him and his team as well. And uh, if anything, um, Organizations like the Center for Historic Houses celebrate the resilience of these uh, figures who against all odds uh, create these wonderful sort of uh, examples of uh, enterprise and, and initiative that sort of defy uh, the logic of the general context in which uh, these actually appear. Now, Jolly was a very uh, interesting personality. You see, he uh, was one with the region in a way that I, I cannot be because I have uh, lived outside of the region for most of the time, but this was his home and he knew every bit of this place, its peoples, its villages, its rivers, uh, its uh, hills and hillocks, its rock shelters. Uh, Jolly had uh, an idea all the time. He knew exactly what was where and he found many of these places and he knit them all together into a kind of circuit all of their own. Uh, so his knowledge of this area was then sort of complemented by his deep devotion to the peoples uh, of which we are a part, the communities to which in some senses we belong. And he also worked tire tirelessly um, to, uh, for rural uplift, uh, for agrarian development, for other kinds of sustainable development goals with these communities among whom he lived and made his life. Uh, with, of course, a mutual sense of respect and sharing, uh, and never, of course, uh, making uh, his brief go out of that particular zone of relationship between uh, the peoples uh, and, and himself. And finally, he was an extraordinary personality also in terms of the number of skills and interests he had. He was an amateur ornithologist, a botanist, uh, an expert in agriculture, in irrigation, in water and soil management, uh, you know, in uh, uh, swimming and, and shooting. He was a great sports person in gastronomy. And he worked to bring together the many traditions to which Kanke Palace has been privy because of our marriage or marriages to princesses in different parts of the country, Gujarat and Orissa included, and local sort of cuisine, the host cuisine. And he has also been covered by well-known channels like Discovery and Epic. And if you want, you can find videos, uh, full-length programs of Jolly's cooking. Uh, and uh, he has helped then preserve uh, some of the very interesting uh, cuisine and gastronomy of this area as well. So I'm talking to you about Jolly in these ways and, and telling you about his personality because that is very much the kind of uh, orientation that he brought to the Kanke Palace Heritage Project. Now, it was not an easy thing to, to do. Uh, as you can understand, uh, the location was a problem. Kanke is by all means an isolated place and very far away from mainstream tourist circuits. 
it's also relatively obscure. People know the big palaces of Rajasthan and Gujarat, but not so much uh, that of, I think, uh, Chhattisgarh and Orissa. So one had to overcome those uh, sort of problems. It is also, as I told you, a modest structure and a recent structure. So in terms of heritage value, in terms of longevity, uh, it doesn't quite compare to other things. And once again, one was faced with the problem of creating a worthwhile destination from very meager sort of resources. Of course, as you know, tourism infrastructure is limited across the country. So you can just imagine how much more accentuated that disadvantage is for a place like Kanki. And of course, uh, on this, I don't need to say very much, but uh, the less said about this, uh, the better. Uh, and you can read it and, and make what you will with it. So it is with these problems that uh, Jolly and his team started working. Uh, the, one of the most important issues that he faced, which resonated more with me than perhaps him, because he was so much part of the region that we are from, actually, historically, was the ethical issues uh, related with anthropological tourism and royal tourism. So anthropology and anthropological tourism uh, in essentially tribal areas can often, well, can often sort of uh, get into the risky zone of the objectification, the exoticization uh, and the condescension, uh, you know, towards with and towards uh, these communities, our host communities, our communities. Similarly, uh, the idea of royal tourism. Of course, this is not uh, something that is faced as squarely by most royal properties, especially in the older circuits in Rajasthan and Gujarat, because the considerations of commerce are so overwhelming that uh, this becomes extremely uh, secondary. Uh, but it was important for us uh, and important for me, especially because of my training as an academic uh, and a liberal kind of uh, left liberal, if you may, uh, historian, etc. Uh, to what extent could we put royalty out there as a kind of attraction? Uh, you know, how did it square with the aspirations of modern India? And with that, of course, was closely associated this question of our own selves and what place we had in new India. And as you know, this has been a rather ambivalent sort of position. On the one hand, you have uh, the state itself going all out to uh, promote uh, royal tourism or heritage tourism connected with royalty with no uh, explanations or qualifications whatsoever. And on the other hand, there is also this general suspicion and dismissal of India's princely and royal past. I'm not trying to valorize this, but for those of us who come from that background and who are trying to make our life in the new uh, society that we live in as, as honest and, and integrated a set of citizens as possible. It is a major living question. And so there were these very important ethical issues as well. But the project that Jolly came up with actually attended to, and partly because of the kind of person he was, attended to and so effortlessly actually uh, managed to resolve all these issues into something very, very interesting and laudable. I'm not saying that everything was taken care of, all these concerns were taken care of uh, entirely, but there was definitely a, a unique model that we see coming into being. Now, uh, one of the things Jolly was very clear was that this project would not be an out and out commercial project. It would be a project for the upkeep of the heritage of the land. Built heritage, the kind that the Center for Historic Houses is very closely working with and is devoted to preserving and uh, promoting. And of course, uh, intangible heritage as well, folklore, uh, deity traditions, religious traditions, what you could call cultural traditions. And our family is very much part of that still. So the political uh, arrangements of the past might have gone away, but not these other social, cultural and religious sort of relationships. And uh, as I was telling you, these are long standing and they have very deep roots in Kanke. So Jolly was clear that this was for, for the upkeep of the heritage, tangible and tangible. It would also have to be for the benefit of the host communities. Nothing would be done that would 
upset that consideration. And then eventually, again, because of the kind of person he was, the kind of openness he had, uh, he thought and believed that the project should serve as a platform for cross-cultural dialogue and understanding between equals, the host communities and the visitors. That there should never be a relationship of different levels of superiority or inferiority. No rescue syndrome, uh, in old style anth anthropological rescue missions. Even the best of anthropologists like Elvin and Gritson couldn't escape that. The idea that they were bringing civilization and they were rescuing uh, peoples in these uh, so-called backward lands. So nothing of that had to come in. Uh, we were absolutely sure and jolly, it came to jolly very naturally. Uh, it came to me because of my academic training, because of the kind of politics that I believe in and uh, profess. But to him, it was very much that. And, I, and you can also see how it, it would be possible for a person like him. So these were the, uh, this was the set of visions that Jolly was working with. What were the real solutions really that he came up with? Of course, I won't have time to give you examples of all of these because I think already I seem to have really crossed uh, the limit, but uh, um, he wanted the host communities to be stakeholders. And it had to be a, a thing that would come from bottom up rather than top down. So these communities and our host communities were involved from, from the beginning and very, very, very centrally in all the arrangements of the hospitality and tourism activities that we were going to do. Further, he believed that only local resources should be used and we should be self-reliant and not depend on corporate or government financing or sponsorship, et cetera. So that, and these are all connected, so that the stakeholder nature of the host communities, their central participation in the events and the processes of the project would remain intact. And then again, very much part of the same vein of thinking. He believed that the focus should be on the ordinary, uh, the everyday and not the spectacular. We didn't want to set up things and make them look attractive for the sake of it. Uh, we just wanted it to be as it was uh, and uh, introduce visitors to that kind of a setting. Um, he also believed that visitors should have multifarious interactions uh, with the host community so that there was a complex, nuanced and comprehensive, meaningful understanding of the societies. And host societies were also invited to understand the visitors in the same way. Uh, this was going to lead to, he believed, uh, if it was a properly followed, sustained and meaningful engagement, where we would often uh, expect our visitors to come again and again and not do a one-off trip and come and build sustainable relationships, uh, meaningful relationships, socially impactful relationships between them, share all their concerns with each other, uh, both ways, of course, and, and not uh, one from the other always. Then, of course, there were the pra practical considerations that if this kind of project was to work, then Kanki should not just be a gateway into Buster, which is in the south, and had the potential of completely overtaking Kanki because that is a more important uh, area and which is where all the anthropological royal tourism often tends to rush. And so how do we create a kind of circuit within Kanker which would make it a standalone thing? So putting together the study of the Mahanadi River Basin, visits to uh, the forest and hill areas of Kanker, gentle short treks, uh, you know, visits to these rock shelters, some of the historic buildings in the locations, old temples, etc. Uh, he managed to create that circuit, which was often able to hold the attention of the guests just for itself, uh, without any reference to where they were going after that or where they were coming from. It would just suck them in and make them part of that, uh, that kind of ambience, that uh, sort of environment that Jolly was wanting to create. And of course, then he believed that Kanker could not stand alone if it stood alone, and that other heritage properties in Orissa and Chhattisgarh would also have to be encouraged uh, to get over their diffidence and uh, overcome these disadvantages and fight them uh, to be able to create their own initiatives. And with this orientation, so that Kanker would become eventually part of a larger set of such properties uh, and, and therefore more sustainable in the long run. 
Uh, again, I don't have the time to go into the details of it, but uh, these are two structures uh, pointing out the aquarium and the enclosure for the man-eating tiger now converted into a gazebo restaurant and the office of one of the schools respectively through contributions by you know, one of our longest standing friends, Michael Manza and John Kendall of England. Uh, then uh, this is again an example of uh, how guests uh, became part of of the schools and contributed in a variety of ways, either by teaching uh, or interacting with students, uh, judging competitions, contributing to scholarships and uh, other kinds of financial support for the school, etc. And Sathi, a kind of NGO that uh, was devoted to the imparting of skills and uh, techniques of marketing to a traditional community of potters in a place called Kumhar Para, about 200 kilometers south of, uh, sorry, about 100 kilometers south of Kanki. Uh, so associating with them, either getting guests to come and uh, purchase uh, the commodities produced by these communities or to live with them for some time and learn their craft uh, and so on and so forth. So a variety of such initiatives were very much part of and are still very much part of the arrangements that Jolly sort of created. Uh, so here, of course, the family found answer to one of the key questions that it was asking. What is its place in new India and how can it be part of uh, that new uh, sort of time uh, without really either having to uh, apologize for uh, their past nor become uh, you know, kind of exhibit, exhibit, uh, exhibitionist, uh, you know, beyond a point, like sometimes uh, these projects can often become. And so uh, they came in as a facilitator. That was the role that we got in forging this interaction, this meaningful, social, socially impactful sort of interaction between cultures, peoples, uh, individuals, uh, you know, communities, histories, uh, and so on and so forth, as you would understand from whatever I've been say, saying so far. And each of us brought in their own things, which is, uh, you know, somebody brought in their managerial techniques, my youngest brother, Ashwini Pratap Dev, somebody brought in their uh, training as teachers, my sister-in-law, uh, Jolly's wife, Rajeshwari Devi, or my sister herself, who started the first English medium kindergarten in Kankir, which is one of the schools that I've been referring to. Uh, Anuradha Devi, uh, my other uh, sister-in-law, Upasana Devi, my mother, of course, Rajmata, Tripureshwari, Kumari Devi, we all joined in, in whatever way is possible. All of us are devoted in some way or the other to, uh, to Kanke, to its heritage, to its communities, to its peoples, to its uh, uh, well-being uh, in some senses. Okay, now I come briefly to uh, my book. And one of the ways in which I personally try to resolve this question of where do I stand in relation to this uh, new India really, and how do we uh, fit in? Of course, for me, it was easy because I had already stepped into another world. I'm an academic, I'm a teacher at St. Stephen's College. So I have made that transition, but I couldn't quite pull away from this. You see, this is, was my reality. So I would always be caught up as it were between these two worlds. So I too had to, uh, resolve it, even if in a way different from how uh, Jolly did or the rest of my family did, much more meaningfully and much more effortlessly because they were living there. Uh, to me, even though I had made that leap into that new world, uh, for me, the dilemmas were also greater because in my case, my experience of the disjuncture between these worlds, this, this articulation between these worlds was also that much greater. So I was this person really caught up in the middle of these two things, neither of which uh, tended to uh, sort of allow me to settle down into some kind of an intermediate position, kept pulling me one way or the other. So my book has been, my book is many things. Let me not just reduce it to that. It is an academic, academic document in itself, and it should be read primarily as that, as I think it will be. But at another level, it is also a personal story. It's a memoir of how I come to terms with a past which is no longer a comfortable past in today's India. And how do I do it? I do it by trying to understand uh, the peoples, the histories, the pasts, the cultures of Kankir, 
to the best of my ability. If the charge against monarchy and kingship is that we have been disso dissociated, although I don't feel that is often the case, and as I feel that as a historian, we need to look at so many different traditions of kingship, rule, political arrangements, etc., that summarily get clubbed into the rubric of kingship of the Western kind, where the king is always this despotic sort of person. I'm not saying that for once the king gives up claims to rule, but often uh, he is forced to negotiate and he accepts these arrangements that are much more uh, allowing of the autonomy of the communities that are ruled than sometimes the neat separation of the ruler and the ruled often allow us to visualize. So in my case, uh, my way in partly was uh, to study the historical polity of Kankir, especially the relationship between the peoples of Kankir and the kings of Kankir, my family. And this is a small attempt to do that. And uh, what I'm arguing in the course of the book is that if we don't look at the polity of Kankir from the administrative records of the Kankir state, but from the oral traditions of its peoples, then we get a very different sense of the polity. And what I've done is to look closely at accounts given in the course of the ancestral deity practices of the peoples of Kankir, uh, which is very much connected to royalty. So in the course of those ancestral, ancestral deity practices, they also comment on their relationship with the king. And what comes into view is this uh, very interesting complex polity where the king is held back, checked, uh, and uh, forced into sharing sovereignty, power, authority, and so on and so forth, so that the political system is far more complex and loose uh, and uh, agential to the people than the idea of a modern state with a clearly powerful king ruling a largely supine and passive population uh, gives us. So that, it takes us away from that view. And uh, uh, what I feel I have done is to look at a source which is not really happily accepted within disciplinary historical practice as a legitimate or valid source for writing histories of uh, these kinds of communities. So for all our uh, newness, uh, we are very dismissive and not accommodating of oral accounts, especially those that are about spirits, about gods, and so on and so forth. So what I've done is to take these very uh, oral accounts, uh, taken them seriously, and looked at the polity of Kanke from that point of, view, point of view that gives the people a much more central place in the organization of the system of rule and governance and administration than our regular disciplinary histories would give them. So this was my way of coming to terms with uh, my past, as it were, my heritage. There's this lovely um, book by um, Desai called The Inheritance of Loss. And I often feel that she's stolen the title of a book I was supposed to write. So perhaps I will still write a book called The Inheritance of Loss Part Two. Uh, but for that, I need your help, support, uh, and blessings. So with that, what I will do is I will uh, stop sharing this and instead now pull out a five minute video, if it is not too much to ask, uh, which will take us quickly through uh, the main thing that we have come here to uh, look at, uh, which is basically the Just a moment. Kankir Palace Heritage. So just give me a moment and I'll pull that video out. I'm not very good at all this, but uh, I was able to do it quite successfully uh, when we tried it out. So just give me a moment. Here I am with you and I will share this video forthwith. Okay, so here it is. And uh, this is for about five plus minutes, so it won't take very long. Can you see the video? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you.
So I would just like to end with uh, a note of thank, a sincere note of thank, thanks to everyone who has contributed to the Kanke Palace Heritage Project. Uh, most importantly, Raja Yogeshwar Raj Singh of Kavardha, Margaret Watt Scarter, Jolly's guru in uh, organizing uh, this property for uh, the purposes it eventually has now come to serve. Um, Sophie Hartman, John, the late John Ash, uh, and, uh, you know, many others who encouraged and supported us um, on this project. 
And eventually, of course, I must uh, really uh, offer my sincere congratulations also and thanks to uh, Dr. Esther Schmidt because of her wonderful initiative, which is historic in itself, of uh, the advocacy, professional, meaningful, sustainable advocacy of uh, historic houses in India, filling a huge gap uh, in our life as a people and as a sort of culture, as a culture and society worth uh, its while. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really don't know where to start. First of all, I would like to say I'm, I'm very honored and I think it's lovely that this lecture is also a legacy for your brother and uh, that he can be remembered. And, um, you know, all of us, you know, some of us here who never met him, I think we've, you know, we've, uh, you've shared this personality with us so closely tied to the palace. And I think it is so important to look at these buildings in the, in the larger context of the people who live there, the people who work there, the people who live in the vicinity, the, the larger landscape. And what you did is not only uh, bring closer the history of this place, but really address some of the larger questions, which indeed are where the kind of motivation for setting up the center. And this question of really, where are the princes now? And, you know, we didn't want to have a circus you know, sometimes which can be, you know, marketed in a horrible way, royal families, you know, used for, exploited in a way for marketing purposes and in and, and tourism. Um, but we wanted to have a serious kind of scholarly study and just, um, you know, acknowledge um, everything that they have done to not only maintain these buildings, but the role they played for the larger communities. And I think the lecture series has been eye-opening for everyone who watched it because there were so many unexpected things that go beyond the Rolls-Royce and um, you know the Cartier jewelry and so on, but really from animal preservation to education and um, um, religious dialogue and so many other initiatives that were important. And so this was really a brilliant lecture and I can't wait um, to read the book, um, which is again, very, very important um, to have these books written in India and to have a new generation of scholars to address this because this is um, missing. It's missing from the curriculum. It's not, um, it's not taught. And, 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 you know, this is just a major gap. And I think this is, goes hand in hand, the scholarship with the center. And I think I'm, I'm really pleased because I, I, I noticed with what we did um, that we were welcomed so warmly. And I'm a foreigner also, I can always say that. So I'm also very humbled that I am allowed to kind of do this. And I think everyone really sees um, that this is important. And from what I've seen now, you know, I'd love to connect you with other properties that you probably know, like Den Canal, Belgaria Palace, because there are many parallels. And as you very well pointed out, it's important, especially many of the properties are in remote areas to put them in touch with others to, you know, maybe cure heritage trails go from one place to another and, and you know this is um, learn from each other take some initiatives and we are also developing kind of non-visitor related business models at the moment I think this is very important for families for craftsmen for other people who've lost their income now during the pandemic so I'm really I'd love to kind of continue this uh, conversation so thank you very much for such an inspiring um, talk um, which was so intellectually rigorous but also had so much personal warmth I think that was just really uh, terrific thank you so much and, um, and Julian will take over to respond to a, a number of the questions we have in the chat thank you Dr. Schmidt so uh, we're just going to start with some of the questions that were uh, put in the chat um, we have one from Diptar Kedatha um, uh, and it said, since you have highlighted the need to create awareness about the geographical, historical, and ethno-archaeological heritage of Kanker, as much as it exists in the case of Western Indian royal houses, what do you think is the role, role of documentation and digitization of such heritage components um, is important? Um, especially in the context of making these accessible in the public domain for academia as well as for the general audience. Right, so uh, thank you so much, Deep Tarko, for that question. 
Um, I think you pointed out a very important sort of uh, aspect of uh, the attempt by Kanke, uh, Kanke Palace Heritage to conserve, preserve tangible, intangible heritage, and so on and so forth. And I must confess that I have been a laggard in this instance because, you know, I've been so busy with my role as a historian, uh, all caught up in the politics of it, which is what we historians do, and rightfully so, that needs to be done as well, that I haven't quite attended to this uh, aspect, which, of course, Dr. Schmidt also has brought home to me in many discussions that we have had. So every time she asks me about uh, what I have uh, in terms of, uh, you know, material goods, etc., so on and so forth, I find that I'm unable to really respond adequately. So I'm actually thinking about, and this has come from Friends of Jolly, uh, and I had a mind to do this as well, as a kind of uh, forum where uh, we will uh, do this now in a much more concerted, systematic way. And uh, a kind of, uh, I wouldn't say museum, but a kind of space, an active space, because there's so many people here attached to Jolly, like, for example, a very well-known wood artist who um, imparts training in wood cutting and carpentry to um, inmates of the local jail, uh, especially those uh, who are being rehabilitated after their uh, sentences uh, due to various uh, reasons, sometimes also naxalism, which is an important concern, as you know, in this uh, area, more to the south, actually. So he helps teach these people who are now in the jail, but are now trying to come out and are seeking rehabilitation, uh, this art of carpentry and the sort of craft of carpentry also. And Jolly was a very, very close associate of Ajay Mandaviji. And Ajay Mandaviji hosted so many of uh, our visitors and spoke to them about what he was doing, made them part of his work, got them to contribute to some of the things that he was doing. So uh, there are, there's that as well, there's that active element. So I don't just want this space to become a kind of museum where we just freeze stuff, but it will also be an active center for continued interaction of the kind that Jolly was promoting with Kanke Palace Heritage as a kind of, uh, uh, you know, as the organizing sort of agent. So, uh, but one part of it will be documentation through photographs, collection of manuscripts, material, documents, other archival goods, uh, etc. Um, uh, you know, also anthropological goods, because I know of a large number of people in the villages who have uh, very valuable, uh, you know, anthropological material, sort of materials from another time, which are in the danger of getting destroyed or lost or damaged and and we could give a home to all of that as well so uh, a bit of a mix of a museum as a kind of activities center so yes uh, uh, one part of it will definitely be that and and i think i'm going to take your help deep tarko is a great uh, uh, you know researcher and ar archivist and i need to catch hold of him as well uh, for some help and uh, of course i should mention in this context the fantastic support we received from uh, jp morgan chase um, for our heritage at risk portal in which we will continue so we are looking into um, open source um, archival management um, 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 opportunities to uh, and for linking data as well from these historic houses which are now in isolation and the idea of the centers of course to be this umbrella and to put them together and you know this will also result in further really interesting um, information because you know once they're no longer in isolation but you can draw parallels you can make references and um, you know, can find further addition to where you might have kind of gaps in your own um, you know, collection also. Yeah, so we are definitely very interested in this and happy to support. So we, we just have uh, one question from Dr. Verinder Dillon. Um, how marginalized historical narrative um, of Kanker is being perceived in the histories of Chattisgarh and Odisha and, or in larger perspective of in the Indian nation. Uh, can you uh, repeat the first uh, line of that, the first uh, few words? How marginalized historic narrative of uh, Kanker is being perceived. Okay. So um, uh, Dr. Dillon, uh, thank you so much for that question and for attending. 
And uh, Dr. Dillon himself is an, uh, you know, an excellent academic and uh, scholar of uh, the history of Haryana. Uh, and I've had occasion to discuss that. And some part of his interest is also going into the heritage of Haryana. Uh, so there is a possibility of connecting there as well. Uh, but on this specific question, so um, there is a history of Kanke, uh, clubbed together with a history of Basta, written by two local academics. It is in Hindi and circulates only in Kanki. Unfortunately, it has not gone out. So uh, the world doesn't know about Kanki in a way. The academic world doesn't know about Kanki. There is an article, uh, there are a couple of articles by me in books and journals uh, that are all. So uh, that's a kind of preview. And now this book, big bomb is coming. I'm going to be dropping this book <laughs> onto everybody. So finally, the Kanke will be revealed in all its uh, messiness. I shouldn't say glory because I'm bringing out the messiness of the, the political system of Kanke uh, and tearing to sheds, uh, you know, my own uh, uh, sort of uh, family's claim to be rulers in some ways, you know. So, um, so uh, this is the first time they will know. But typically speaking, the history of Chhattisgarh is in its infancy. There's very little work. And I'm thinking long term of a kind of people's history of Chhattisgarh, which of course will have princely states, but it will also be uh, a different kind of history in the manner of Howard Zinn's people's history of America. Although, of course, I will not be able to reach that level of exposition and rigor and uh, painstaking research and the breadth of vision and, and the depth of uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, elegance. But of prose, but uh, something like that, the history of Chhattisgarh, so that, uh, so what happens with Chhattisgarh is that Chhattisgarh is made to follow a kind of national script. As you know, like regions like Haryana and other places also have to do that. So if something is happening in Delhi, you have to, the only history that Chhattisgarh can have is, is if you can find that thing happening in Chhattisgarh also. So there's national movement in Delhi, so there must be a national movement in Kanker and Bastar and wherever else. And unless it's there, it is not worth knowing. If there is something else happening in Delhi, then you have to find something. So we have been sort of uh, just made to duplicate and accept some kind of a Delhi, North India based history for our history. Uh, so I'm not looking at a kind of atavistic, irredentist retrieval of the lost voice, but nevertheless, a large area like this uh, cannot just uh, uh, speak through a false voice. We need to uh, study our own past in whatever complexity it might reveal itself uh, to us. And so therefore, uh, I am hoping to, of course, and this is not going to be a one person project. As you can see, this is going to. So one of my long term plans uh, that happens sooner than later is to have a Chhattisgarh Historical Association or Historians Association and get together uh, local historians and historians working outside. Often the problem is that some of us are working outside and we don't connect with these local histories here. Sometimes these uh, local historians, very rigorous in their own way, don't connect with what is happening outside in the metropolitan area. So I, I find myself in this again, unique position of the borderlands where I can bridge the gap. I'm not sure how successfully or adequate. Uh, so bring together people to put together a uh, kind of history of people's history of Chhattisgarh. So we will actually now be wanting to step out from the margins and to say something to the country as a whole and to the world as a whole. But of course, all the while remembering that we don't want to get trapped into an essentialist project of eventually finding and getting out some kind of a authentic history of Chhattisgarh. Not at all. I don't think we can ever get there. In fact, our problem and my trust will be to encourage people to ask more questions of very easy assumptions we make. For example, when the question of the first chief minister of Chhattisgarh was being discussed, the question that was often raised in political circle was of who was more legitimately sort of meant to be the leader of the state. And there some people said that the Mati Putra, the son of the soil, uh, you know, and certain kinds of tribal communities should have in some ways, uh, you know, access to the top position in the state. Now, their understanding of Adivasi history is also extremely skewed. Adivasi communities live intermixed 
live intermixed with all kinds of popul subaltern populations, what we would call other backward castes and so on and so forth. So to start this thing of who is the son of the soil and who the chief ministership has to be given and that it should be reserved for one community is going to open a kind of conflict in Chhattisgarh, which I'm not saying that there is no conflict or historically hasn't been a conflict in Chhattisgarh. All societies will have conflict, but not of the kind and level that we see in many other parts of North India. So a people's history will build, bring together so many of these other things as well. So many communities have migrated, the Kachis, the Sindhis, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Punjabis uh, over time, the Bharathas in, during that time. We can't call them outsiders. Uh, just as we know, the tribal peoples have also moved over a period of time. The tribal peoples themselves don't have a sense of themselves as opposition, always oppositionally standing against the other. You know, they live intermixed. There are issues, but these issues cannot be refined and, and kind of, uh, you know, fixed in stone. Uh, so anyway, so you know, we will be uh, trying to step out and in, in a kind of uh, way that might not always be uh, acceptable to sometimes the more politically correct sort of communities to which I myself belong in some sense. So it's a struggle, but uh, I, I, we'll, we'll take it uh, as it comes. Thank you, Dr. Dillon. Thank you very much. And um, with, with a glance to the time, I would like to conclude. But um, if you would like to continue the discussion, please. And we are very active on all social media, especially our Facebook group is very active. It's a real community, special interest group of people who are owners of historic houses or heritage enthusiasts or heritage experts. And of course, if you wanted to um, find out more, um, please contact um, uh, either um, uh, Dr. Deo um, through the university or the center, get in touch with us uh, and we will forward any kind of messages or further questions. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you to everyone who's uh, left their comments. Uh, sorry, I have not been able to respond individually, but I hope I will be able to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. It was a really great presentation, sir. Thank you so much, Anirudh. Thank you, Thank you Andrew. Fantastic, Aditya. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, 